You can look like you have it together. You can look successful. You can look happy. You can tuck it, paint it, Botox it, tan it. You can look like you've got it all together, but something can still be missing. Verse eight says, there was no breath in them. Today, we're going to be dipping back into the Old Testament, looking at um, a passage from an obscure prophet, a guy named Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37. And if you've been in church, you probably heard this story uh, told before. And so maybe I'm going to share it through a little bit of a new lens today. I'm excited for what God's got us to hear today. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the, on the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall Live. Someone say amen to that. Ezekiel 37 is a profound case study in the power of surroundings. It's a case study in the power of surroundings because we all know that surroundings are incredibly powerful. And our surroundings will either affect us or we will affect our surroundings. And there's quite a contrast here for Ezekiel as he's standing in this valley of dry bones. There's quite a contrast between what he knows God can do, between what he knows God is able to do, and what he's experiencing in this moment. He's in some pretty upsetting surroundings. Surroundings are so powerful that this year retailers will spend tens of millions of dollars researching your buying behaviors to determine what colors they should display at certain seasons of the year, what fragrance they should pump through the ventilation system, what sounds, what music, how many beats per minute will get you to spend more money in their store because they understand the power of surroundings. The power of surroundings is evident in the educational system. My mom was an educator for over 30 years, and for a few years, uh, she taught in a very uh, low-income, kind of poverty-stricken area of East Texas, an area that had been hit really hard uh, by the drug drug epidemic and just substance abuse in general. And what would happen is she would have these kids that when they would come into surroundings that she could control, she would see them grow. She would see them flourish and and thrive and progress. But as soon as they would leave those surroundings and they would step into other surroundings that were outside of my mom's control, surroundings that were often chaotic, that progression that they had seen in my mom's classroom turned into regression when they got into different environments. Surroundings are quite powerful. I learned a personal lesson in surroundings in February of 2020, about a month right before the world uh, shut down because of COVID. Uh, My father-in-law and my mother-in-law graciously gifted us a trip that Christmas to a little place that my family had never been called Walt Disney World. The night before we were to leave, we had to like leave for the airport, I think at 4.30 in the morning to catch a very early flight. It's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm sitting in the bed playing Candy Crush or something, and my wife, Valerie, looks at me and she says, John, are you going to pack? And I said, yeah, I'll get to it in just a minute. And she went kind of on, on, her, on her way, packing, doing what she was doing. And then she looked at me a few minutes later and she said, John, are you even excited about this trip? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I'm excited for my boys. They're going to have a lot of fun. But Disney, Disney World is it's for kids, not for, for grown-ups. Fast forward 72 hours after being in the Disney bubble, surroundings that they could control, this guy is skipping through the Magic Kingdom with the Mickey ears, eating the Mickey pretzel, singing It's a Small World After All because surroundings are incredibly powerful. Ezekiel in chapter 37 is surrounded 
by bones. He's in this graveyard. He's in this battlefield scene. You thought that waking up to dirty laundry spilling out over the top of your laundry baskets was a rough way to start your day. Ezekiel here is surrounded by death, by desolation, by despair. But this is quite a contrast between, uh, from what he had experienced in chapter 36. We just read chapter 37, but chapter 36 comes before chapter 37. That's the kind of stuff they teach you in seminary. Chapter 36 comes before chapter 37, and in chapter 36, God gives Ezekiel a very different vision. Because in 36, Ezekiel is surrounded by life. He's surrounded by restoration and renewal. It says this in chapter 36, verse 34. And the land that was desolate, and I just want to pause there really quickly. The land that was desolate is talking about the nation of Israel at this time. They had been taken captive by a neighboring country, and they had exiled the best. They had exiled the brightest out of this land. These people were living dislocated, disjointed from their their native homeland, from their homes, from their family. So this is the desolate land that's being written about here. It says, and the land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, which was God's original intention, a place where man was created to grow, to thrive, to flourish, to walk in harmony in their relationship with God and with others. The Garden of Eden before sin Shame and guilt entered the picture. God's telling Ezekiel here, he says, Ezekiel, I am in the process of making all things new. Aren't you glad we worship a God who is in the process of making all things new? Israel is in trouble. They're they're exiled here. They've been laid waste because of their sin and their disobedience. But our God is about restoring brokenness that he didn't cause. And he says, Israel... This land that was desolate is going to be made like the Garden of Eden. Verse 35 says, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord. And I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. Now, this has not yet happened. Jerusalem is still destroyed, but our God lives outside of space, and our God lives outside of time, so he doesn't have to wait for it to happen in order to declare what will happen. He tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I'm going to bring your past, and I'm going to bring your present situation as a nation of Israel into alignment with my vision for the future. He says, I'm going to rebuild this nation, but I'm also, most importantly, he says, I'm going to rebuild my reputation. Because what does he say there? He says he's doing all this so they will know that I am the Lord. This phrase, know that I am the Lord, is used 55 times in the Old Testament. God is trying to make it crystal clear that his one objective, his one purpose in life, and all that he does is to lift his name high so that everyone will have an awareness that he is the sovereign creator of God over the universe, to know that he is the Lord. But the scene shifts from chapter 36 to chapter 37. It shifts where God takes Ezekiel from the garden to the graveyard. He goes from the garden to the graveyard. Have you ever had to go from the garden to the graveyard in your life? Maybe for you on Sunday mornings, this is your garden experience. This life-giving experience where you step in here and you're able to worship, you're able to receive a message from God, you live uh, in close relationship with God, you're experiencing the presence of God, the promises of God, you're living in relationship with other believers, this is your garden experience. And then you leave here, you wake up on on Monday morning, and you go to your work and you're stepping into the graveyard. Has anybody ever had to go from the garden to the graveyard, the garden where you see life all around you? There's a shift in your surroundings, from surroundings that are life-giving to surroundings that are life-taking. These scenes and these shifts seem to contradict what God promised us when we were in our garden experience. And this scene for Ezekiel in chapter 37 seems to contradict what God had just showed him in chapter 36 because he stepped out of the garden and now he's surrounded by desolation, by dislocated, disjointed, dry bones. Ezekiel's staring at a garden one moment and the graveyard the next. But life was like this, right? 
Life is like this. Because of sin and shame and the consequence that we have because of that, we find ourselves living in this instability, this ever-shifting landscape. We find ourselves in these life-giving moments, one moment, and then a completely different experience that's life-taking. God gives Ezekiel this promise in chapter 37, this strategy that I believe is for Ezekiel and for Israel uh, back in his time, but I also believe it's a strategy for us. And I believe that it's a strategy that if you do this, you will see graveyards turn into gardens in your own life through the power of God's word. God says to Ezekiel, hey, Ezekiel, uh, you remember that vision that I gave you in chapter 36 in the garden? Here's what I want you to do, Ezekiel. I want you to build a bridge from the graveyard to the garden using your words. Or more specifically, I want you to build a bridge from the graveyard to the garden using the word of the Lord. Verse 4 says, And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This word prophesy can be confusing. It just simply means to preach, to speak to these dry bones, speak the word of the Lord over these dry bones. And you have to imagine, this was a pretty weird request for Ezekiel, right? He must have felt pretty ridiculous walking through this valley of dry bones talking to these dead things. This is going to feel pretty ridiculous to him, pretty weird to him, but sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes God's going to call you to do some weird things in your own life. Sometimes you have to stop talking about what you see and start talking to what you see. Our problem is we spend way too much time talking about what's around us and not enough time talking to what's around us. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy over these bones. Most of us, if we're being honest, are really good at describing all the dry bones in our life. We're really good at describing all the problems. We're really good at describing all the broken things in our lives. But God places Ezekiel in this valley, and he doesn't say, Ezekiel, speak about what you see. He places him in this valley. He doesn't say, Ezekiel, speak about what you see. Instead, speak about what I said until what you see looks like what I said. He didn't bring him in for color commentary. What does he say? He says to hear the word of the Lord. Speak the word of the Lord into this hopeless scene. The truth is a lot of Christians are really good at identifying all the spiritual bones in their body. They've got all the vocabulary down. They know all the theological lingo. But it's not about whether you can point to the spiritual bones in your body that tell us if you have the spirit of God in you. It's when you speak, do your surroundings change? It's when you speak, has the word of God that you have hidden into your heart, does it roll off of your lips? When you're speaking over dead situations in your life, do you preach the gospel or do you preach something else? That's the barometer for a spirit-led life. And the question for us today is, are you, through the power of God, going to change your surroundings or are your surroundings going to change you? Are you going to change your surroundings or are your surroundings going to change you? This is the decision that we must all make in the valley of dry bones because we are all surrounded by broken things. I love what Welsh author, pastor, theologian, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones had to say about this very thing. He was preaching a sermon on Psalm 42 and and Dr. Lloyd-Jones said this, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Psalm 42, which says this, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise his name, my salvation, and my God. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones goes on to write in this sermon, or say in this sermon, concerning Psalm 42, he said, Now this man's treatment was this, and instead of allowing the self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, he asked. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. Speak what? Speak the word of the Lord. Speak the gospel over whatever hopeless situation that is causing your soul to be downcast. A pastor and theologian, 
author Jeff Vanderstelt had this to say about this. He said that we as Christians should speak the gospel every day, numerous times daily to yourself. You will not be able to lead other people in this unless you are first leading yourself. He's telling us to speak the gospel to the dry bones in your life. So Ezekiel is led by the Spirit of God through this valley, and God says, Ezekiel, you see, you see these bones? He says, yes, Lord, I see these bones. They're very dry, aren't they, Ezekiel? He says, yes, Lord, they're, they're very dry. In fact, they're about to turn to dust and be blown away with the wind, aren't they, Ezekiel? He says, yes, Lord, they are. Verse 3 says, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. The question here is not can God cause dead bones to live again, not can God bring life to dead things, not can God bring hope into hopeless situation. The question here is can these bones live? This is not a hypothetical question. This is a specific question for Ezekiel. God's asking Ezekiel, can this situation be redeemed? Can the gospel be made manifest here? Here is the truth for us Christians. If we're being honest, we believe that God can. We believe that God is able, but we doubt that he will in us and in our situation. That's the truth. And when we understand that so often, we recognize the problem's not with God. The problem's with us. The problem is with our lack of faith in God and in our situation. Verse 3, he says, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you, you know. The challenge for us today is for us to stop describing our problems and to start declaring his promises. We need to stop describing our problems and start declaring his promises. But the truth is we just often don't have the faith to declare. We need to stop listening to that downcast soul that Psalm 42 spoke about and instead say hope in God. We need to stop describing our problems and start declaring his promises. Verse 4 says, Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Notice that Ezekiel describes the miracle before he can see the evidence. He describes, he exercises his faith through his words. He describes the miracle before he can see any evidence of it in front of him. But the truth for us is that so often we we've, we've flip the script. We do a spiritual autopsy on everything that we see as dead in our life. We can describe in great detail everything that's wrong, but what if we made the shift? What if we made the graveyard shift? To believe the garden when we find ourselves in the graveyard, to believe chapter 36 when we find ourselves living in chapter 37. What if we made the graveyard shift to speak the gospel, the gospel of life, life, hope, resurrection, when we're surrounded by nothing but death? What if we made the shift? Verse 6 says, And I will lay sinews or tendons upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7 says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. I'm from Texas. We don't say our G's. We say rattling. Everyone say rattling. There was a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. Notice the order of events here. It says that Ezekiel obeyed, Then he heard a sound, and then he saw the action. He obeyed, he heard the sound, and then he saw the action. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we choose not to live, if we choose to not exercise our faith and wait until we see the evidence before we declare the promises, we're living by sight, not by faith. There was another prophet in the Old Testament, a man named Elijah, and he was a prophet to Israel during this great drought. They hadn't rained there for years. And it says that Elijah prayed and said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain when there wasn't a cloud in the sky. That is what faith looks like. It says there was a rattle. There was a sound. 
There was a noise, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. Ezekiel repeated the promise of God. Nothing more, nothing less. It was that simple. And it said that it, bones came together, bone to its bone. But the story shifts here in verse 8. The story shifts. So now that I've established my introduction, I can get to my message this morning. <laughs> Just kidding. But this was the thing. This is the hard-hitting element, the hard-hitting truth of this text for me this week as I studied. I don't know if you're like me, but whenever I study, when I get in God's word or I'm preparing for a lesson or for a sermon, there's always something surprising that kind of just jumps off the page and it throws confetti in the air, does a cartwheel, waves its hands and says, over here, preach about me. And it was this thing in verse eight. This is the thing. It says, and I looked and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. There was no breath in them. The situation looks better than when Ezekiel arrived, but it doesn't mean that it is better. You can look like you have it together. You can look successful. You can look happy. You can tuck it, paint it, Botox it, Tan it. You can look like you've got it all together, but something can still be missing. Verse 8 says, There was no breath in them. So, let me think about a marriage. You can have the wedding ring, you can have the marriage certificate, you can have the photo album from your wedding, the video from your wedding, you can have all the structure all the trappings of a marriage, but something can still be missing. As a church, we can have all the tendons and the flesh and the bones, but something can still be missing. We can have the building. We can have the classroom. We can have the website. We can have our social media accounts. We can have YouTube. We can have all of the structure, but something can still be missing. What's missing? This is the thing. This is why so many people look religious, why so many people look like they have it together, like they're happy, but something is missing. Verse 9 says, Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Everyone just breathe out where you are. God's saying, Ezekiel, the problem with my people is that they're out of breath. Maybe saying to us today, John, the problem with my church is it's short of breath. It has the form, but something's missing. It's out of breath. He says, I want you to prophesy to the breath. This word breath is the Hebrew word ruah. And in the Old Testament, it's translated as wind, as spirit, as breath. It's all the same word. And it first shows up in the creation story, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, then the Lord God formed the man of dust and from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the ruah, the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. This tells us that the man had the form but he wasn't alive. He wasn't a living creature until he had the Ruah, the spirit, the breath of God. It says he formed the man, filled the man with his Ruah. Church, some of us are formed, but we're not filled. Some of us are formed, but we're not filled. We're just walking around like spiritual skeletons until we have the spirit. Verse 9 says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I was thinking, if, if I come out here, as I was preparing this week, and told the church to prophesy to the breath, I was kind of going back and forth with God. I was thinking, God, if I go out there and say prophesy to the breath, that the church is going to be looking at me, exactly like you're looking at me right now. I predicted this very moment that this would happen. So I was thinking about how can I put this into terms that we would all understand. And it made me think back to last November. Some of you know this part of my story, but my wife had been battling uh, cancer for a year. And it kind of at the tail end of that, I took a little sabbatical trip up to Maine. And uh, I started to notice there were some things just kind of off with me physically, but I brushed it aside. So I was by myself in Maine actually praying about this opportunity at Cross Life at that very time. 
And um, long story short, I was in my hotel room, and I realized that I could no longer breathe, that something was very off. I could no longer breathe. So I rushed to the local ER. By the time I got to the desk to check in at the ER, I could no longer stand. I could no longer speak. I could no longer breathe. They threw me on a stretcher, took me back to the cardiac ICU. And what I found out is that I was unaware that for over two years, I had been in atrial fibrillation. AFib, my heart was completely failing. I was in heart failure in that moment. My lungs were filled with almost 30 pounds of fluid to the point where I could no longer breathe. I was in renal stenosis. My organs were shutting down. And I'll never forget laying in the cardiac ICU, staring up at the ceiling, just trying to breathe, but my lungs were so filled with liquid, I couldn't even make the motion to breathe. There was nothing I could do to breathe. I couldn't make a sound. I couldn't make a noise in that moment. And they put this machine on my face. I think you can see it here in the picture called a BiPAP machine. And what this would do is that if I could just give that machine just a little bit of room in my lungs, it fills any empty space with pressure. And over a couple of hours, it began to push all of that fluid out of my lungs. And I remember this very profound moment when I'm laying there in the bed, the first time that I heard a noise from me was when I breathed for the very first time on my own after laying there. And you don't realize that you hear your own breath until you don't. And I remember that moment recognizing, you know, that something critical had gone on with me in this moment. And why do I say that? I say that because the enemy knows that your life as a believer was meant to make a sound that your life was meant to make a noise, that your life was meant to declare the praise to the one who called you out of darkness, but he wants to take your breath away. He wants to hit you so hard that you're left staggered and confused. He wants to knock the spiritual breath out of you so that you're just walking around gasping for air. The enemy wants to take your breath away because the enemy also knows that if you ever catch the breath of God, if you ever learn what it means to abide daily with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, then your life begins to make the sound that it was intended to make, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to wash over your life, over your family, over your home, and over your work situation. The enemy knows that if the church ever catches its breath, catches the spirit that it will become the unstoppable force that Jesus talked about in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And this is why he's fighting you so hard. He wants to keep you distracted, keep you pointing at all the bones in your life. Because until you breathe, you're just bones. You're just a spiritual skeleton. Verse 10 says, so I prophesied as he commanded me, Ezekiel saying, I caught my breath, and the breath came back in, or came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Think about the contrast here from where we entered this scene. He's surrounded by dead, dry bones, and now he's surrounded by an army. This is exactly what God wants to do in your situation. In those areas of your life that you feel like are hopeless, those relationships that you feel like are beyond repair, God says, I want to surround you with a warring army that God fights for us as Scripture teaches us. And in Mark chapter 15, in Jesus' final moments on the cross before his life exited his body, Mark 15 verse 37 says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. As he's surrounded by the disciples, his friends, his mother, they thought it was over. As he expelled this last bit of oxygen from his lungs and they watched his life left his body, they thought it was over. But church, when Jesus breathed out, he made a way for us to breathe in. Because three days later, he would take his first breath on the other side of the grave. He would rise again and he would make forgiveness reconciliation, restoration, redemption available for you and for me. So when he breathed out on the cross, he made a way for us to breathe in. John chapter 20, Jesus gathered with his disciples. It says, when he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He presented himself to them after 
his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? These are the same questions that we ask. They're saying, Jesus, are you just going to you know, step back in, fix stuff? put things together? When are you going to do what you need to do? And listen to what Jesus says to them. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, he's telling them, don't hold your breath for me to come back. Don't sit idly by waiting for me to come back. I have work for you to do. I've created you for something more. In verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit the Ruah has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He says, you will receive power. You will receive life. When the spirit, the breath, the Ruah comes upon you. Church, some of you are dying spiritually because you're not breathing. You have the structure you have the bones together. You, could, you come to church, maybe you even go to a small group, but you haven't learned to breathe. To daily abide in the Spirit. Daily be led by the Spirit. Daily be guided by God's Word. Church, some of you are dying because you haven't learned to breathe. And you may say to me, well, well John, you know, I come to church every Sunday morning, and I come to small group every Sunday morning. It just isn't working. Brother, you can't breathe once a week and expect to live. You can't show up on Sunday morning and take a deep breath and say, oh, I'm good till next week, see you then. That's not how this works. You have to learn to breathe daily, walking in stride with the Spirit and with other believers. And I love how this vision in Ezekiel 37 how it ends. It's so wild. And if you are a Bible nerd, you're going to love this. Because let's go back to Ezekiel 37, verse 9. Look at what it says. It says, note the word, the second word here, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Now, in Ezekiel's vision, the breath, the wind comes from the outside, from the proverbial four corners of the earth. But Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. In Ezekiel's vision, the, the winds come from the ends of the earth, but that's different than what Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, church, I have given you the breath to go to the ends of the earth. We have been given the breath of God. We are the body of God. And we are the body of Christ. And it's time for the body to breathe out. We have been given this breath to go, to take the gospel to a dead dying and lost world. I want you to stand on your feet wherever you are. Just stand with me for just a minute. I want you to do something with me. I want you to take a deep breath and hold it. Don't let it out. Take a deep breath, hold it, don't let it out. Now take another deep breath, hold it, don't let it out. Take another deep breath, hold it, don't let it out. How long can you live like that? Okay, you can breathe now. How long can you live like this? Church, some of us are dying spiritually because we're not breathing in, but some are dying spiritually because you are not breathing out. You're consuming, you're not contributing. God gives us the breath, the ruah, to breathe into others. Acts 1.8, you've been given the breath to go, not just to be a disciple, but to make disciples. And church, as we live this way and we breathe out to the world around us, we're living in a posture of submission and worship, praising God. I love the book of Psalms. It's the largest collection of poems and songs and hymns, the largest book in the Bible. And as God inspired writers in Psalm, he's thinking like, okay, how do I put a cap on this? What's the, the capstone, the closing message that I want everyone to, to read after this great book? In Psalm 150, look at what it says. 
He's summing up 150 chapters with this. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has, let everything that has, praise the Lord.